When you conduct research about a group of people, it's rarely possible to collect data from every person in that group. In this lecture, we will discuss the sampling process in a quantitative research. Many problems in scientific research cannot be solved without employing sampling tools. Since most social phenomena consist of a larger number of units, a researcher cannot always interview, test, or observe each unit under controlled conditions. Sampling tools solve this dilemma, for they help researchers select representative units from a population. From the data gathered from these units, researchers draw inferences about the nature of the entire population. They generalize that what is true of the sample will be true of the population. Sampling does not consist in collecting data casually from any conveniently located units. To obtain a representative sample, one systematically selects each unit in a specified way under controlled conditions. Several steps are involved in the sampling process. A researcher must define the population, procure an accurate and complete list of the units in the population, if possible, draw representative units from the list, and obtain a sufficiently large sample to represent the characteristics of the population. The first step is to define the population. A population is a well-defined group of people or other entities. The size of populations can vary. Researchers might like to obtain data about all the students in the Philippines, but the time and resources at their disposal may cause them to limit a study to a more accessible population, such as the students in one community, say Davao City. But they must recognize that the findings obtained for a randomly selected sample of students in Davao City can be generalized to all students in that city but not all students in the Philippines. Students from Davao City will probably differ in many respects from students in Cebu City, Manila, Baguio City, etc. Considerable thought must be given in choosing a population. The members must possess the property under consideration. The definition of the population must clearly identify what units are to be included and excluded. If a population is vaguely defined, one does not know what units to consider when selecting the sample. To obtain information about students' behavior, for example, researchers must define the specific population about which they intend to draw generalizations. Do they want to include elementary, high school, or college students? Certainly, students' behavior drawn from a population that includes elementary students will differ from college students. People are repeatedly deceived by institutional, political, and advertisers' reports because they assume the generalizations presented in a research were drawn from one population when they actually were drawn from another. The next step is to obtain a list of the population. Once the population is clearly identified, the researchers obtain or construct a complete, accurate, and up-to-date list called a frame of all the units in the population. This task may consume considerable time and obstacles may arise that will prevent them from obtaining the required data. Suppose that you wish to obtain information concerning students' profile in Davao City. Schools will have these records available, but they may be unwilling to reveal or give the list of students enrolled to their institution. In many instances, the researchers may find that no list of units in a population is available. Suppose that you want a list of unenrolled students in Cebu City this school year. 
it is safe to assume that no one keeps a record of all unenrolled students in that city. Many researchers produce disappointing results because they use available population frames without investigating the methods that were used to compile them and without ascertaining whether all members of the population were included. Sometimes, they select unit lists that are outdated, contain inaccuracies or duplications, or do not adequately represent the population. A classic example of this occurred in 1936 when telephone directories and automobile registrations were used to obtain a sample of how people in United States would vote in the presidential election. On the basis of the data obtained from this sample, the prediction was made that Alfred Landon would be elected. However, it was Franklin Roosevelt who won the election. What went wrong? Since the telephone directories and automobile registrations did not include the great number of voters in the lower economic brackets, a sample selected from these lists did not represent all members of the voting population. The third step is to select a representative sample. After defining a population and listing all the units, researchers select a sample of units from the list. Drawing a sample is a relatively simple task but fatal mistakes are frequently made. If units are selected that are conveniently at hand, a group of volunteers, the first 25 names on a list, the people who live one block, or the parents who attended a meeting, these units may differ from the remaining units. Hence, they may not be representative of the population. Private school students are units in all students in Davao City, for example. But generalizations derived from data concerning their behavior, communication skills, study habits, and learning styles are not applicable to all students in Davao City because public school students were not representative in these units. A good sample must be as nearly representative of the entire population as possible. The last step is to obtain an adequate sample. Some samples are too small to represent the characteristics of the population. The IQ scores of two students selected as a sample from a population of 100 children, for example, are not likely to represent the average IQ of that group. But how large must a sample be to achieve an acceptable degree of reliability. No specific rules on how to obtain an adequate sample have been formulated. For each a situation presents its own problems. If the phenomena under study are homogeneous, which means the population variance is small, a small sample is sufficient. But if the units under study are variable, which means the population variance is very high, a much larger sample is necessary. The greater the variability of the phenomena, the greater is the difficulty of obtaining an adequate sample. Increasing the size of the sample is of little value, of course, if units are not chosen in a way that ensures representativeness of the sample. The safest procedure is to use as large a sample as possible. In general, three factors determine the size of an adequate sample, the number of the population, the type of investigation, and the degree of precision desired. Researchers give careful consideration to these factors and then select the sample design that will provide the desired precision at minimum cost. That's it for our video. I hope you learned something. Thank you very much.